PokerStatic.com. We bring you the interviews you want to hear. Now with your hosts, Brett Oliverio and Eric Bickle, the Poker Static Hot Seat. What's up? Welcome to a brand new edition of the Poker Static Hot Seat. Brett Oliverio with Eric Bickle. And joining us tonight via video is Erica Motino. And, of course, her fiancé, Dave Sands, he's actually on the phone with us live from Vancouver. Thanks for coming on, guys. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having us. Now, Erica, Happy we were sort of talking here. off air. <laughs> cool, cool. We were sort of talking off air, Erica, sort of about what your life has been like the last two months because you guys are now poker's sort of it couple. And I imagine it's only going to pick up from here sort of as the main event uh, airs. What's What's, you know, the last few months been like for you on a personal level? Um, The last few months have been pretty crazy. You know, I went into the tournament not having very much experience, and uh, so I didn't have really high expectations for myself and ended up making it far. And, uh, you know, having Dave alongside with me was just a really great experience for the two of us, and I I think it kind of helped build our relationship. Um, In terms of, you know, what's going on with us in poker, it's kind of just been a whirlwind, you know, uh, just taking it day by day, but it's really exciting and everything's going really well. I, I got to imagine, uh, Dave, now you've been around a little longer. More of, uh, I don't know, it's my understanding you, you, you killed the online team maybe a little more, although you're doing great live too, that your Q rating has gone way up, right? I, I imagine Erica, everywhere she goes now in Vegas, she's recognized. And Dave, Dave how much more has your recognition factor gone up since the World Series? Um, yeah, well, the recognition factor has definitely gone up a lot just because um, you know, it really speaks to the power of, of, like, mainstream network television. I feel like I play poker at a pretty high level for the past, you know, four-plus years online. Right. And, you know, just the exposure on ESPN, you know, like you said, the the like the recognizability is, like, skyrocketed. So it's just kind of telling how, how valuable, like, you know, the TV time is and just how great of a contribution to – poker really the ESPN broadcasting is because that's really mainstream America's like plug to the poker world and I I guess I didn't really realize that as much but in terms of just day-to-day life it really hasn't you know changed around my life too much I feel like I was you know pretty involved in poker before and and you know accustomed to just like feeling a good amount of pressure to succeed and just having high expectations of myself regardless so it hasn't really changed too much on a day-to-day level but definitely some really exciting prospects for the future and it was just really fun to see Erica do so well because I've known for a while that she had a lot of potential and she was making some good runs online. So it was just great to great to have her do so well in her first live 10K. Yeah, it is incredible. Now, Dave, is this is is this something that you that you wanted? Because you know, I, you know, just when you Google your name, you know, up comes a thread on two plus two that's like the best player that no one's talking about. You, million, you know, most majors won online, all these accolades, but you know, people weren't really talking about your name too too much before uh the television recognition of course you signed with doyle's room was this mainstream recognition something that you've always wanted or something that just sort of came along um no i definitely wouldn't say that either eric and i are really like you know fame hungry people who are in it for the notoriety i just genuinely enjoy playing poker and you know i had some other really good opportunities for things to do after college but you know, I didn't get into poker to be famous or so that, like, when I walked down the street, people were like, hey, we saw you guys on TV. Um, I got into it, like I said, because I really enjoy the game. Obviously, it's lucrative, and I just think it's, like, kind of a challenging thing to do every day. But I, I, at the same time, I definitely don't, you know, mind the extra attention and the fame. And I feel like Eric and I are both good ambassadors for poker, and we work really hard at that. So, you know, hopefully it just has a positive impact on the game in general. I mean, I feel like Eric's story is really compelling, and, Hopefully a lot of women will get into the game as a result of it. So, you know, it's a nice side benefit to have the recognition, but also feel like we're good ambassadors for the game and we're, and we're just sort of helping the game grow as a whole, which I definitely think has occurred. You know, Dave, I'm glad that you say that because there's so many people out there that they act like, oh, you know what, I don't want to be famous. I just do this because I love it, whatever. But who doesn't love attention? You know, attention is great for everybody. And particularly in this business, where as your Q rating goes up, I mean, that helps everything with you. That opens up more doors for you 
poker wise, right? So I'm glad that you that you're embracing it. What uh, Erica? What's been your experience so far? To kind of this be your first 10K to have this great run, uh, you know, to be featured so prominently on ESPN. Uh, is this what you thought it would be like, or is it even more? Um, well, this is obviously a really, you know, just a brand new experience for me. I've never really been in front of the cameras on, um, you know, talk of the media. I actually worked in television in Los Angeles behind the scenes. So now I'm getting a little bit of a taste of what it's like to be in front of the camera. Um, yeah, I think it's a little bit more than I expected, you know. Going into the main event, obviously a lot of the women get coverage, so I was getting a little coverage, pictures, pictures taken and so forth. And then as the days went on and, you know, it was focused a lot on uh, myself and the other women still involved in the tournament, you know, it got more and more. And then when I was on ESPN, you know, it's just, uh, it's just a lot. Um, you know, it's been really fun. It's been fun to have people recognize me. I would say, you know, I agree with Dave 100% that we're not really looking for the fame, but, you know, it comes with it. And so it's great to have it. Dave, Erica, how, how aware were you of your appearance when you're on ESPN? Because here you are, you have a chance to win, you know, the biggest poker tournament in the entire world, but yet you're on ESPN. You know, you're a good looking chick. Were you sort of dolling yourself up? Were you just getting out of bed focused on poker? Um, did ESPN have a talk with you and say, hey, you know, maybe you should wear this color. Uh, maybe you should, we'll do your makeup. How does that, how did that work for you? Um, it was actually funny. The one day that I decided that I was not going to do my hair, it was the first day that I was on ESPN. Mm -hmm. So I was a little bit disappointed about that because I had no, um, they didn't tell me ahead of time, you know, it was a random draw. They just, you know, I got the card and was moved to the feature table. So I really didn't have time to, you know, make sure I looked okay. So I just, you know, was hoping for the best. Um, uh, yeah, so I didn't really have time to prepare. And at the same time, you know, I got up every morning and picked out an outfit, you know, like I would any other day. And I really was trying to focus on poker more so than anything else. Obviously, keep. Did I lose her? She kind of locked up there. Oh, what the call? She'll call us back. Sorry, Dave. She just lost lost the connection lost there. Lost our connection for a second. No problem. She'll, she'll call us. I want to ask you. You can kind of think about it. Uh, you know, as we're chatting, I do want to ask you, Dave, what you saw in her that you said you knew she had a lot of potential. Like she had had some results online, but how, you know, because it's. I mean, when did she start playing poker? Actually. Um, well, she's been playing online for, like, over two years now, like two and a half years, I think. And, you know, she's play she played some smaller stakes tournaments and then, like, the bigger field majors in the weekends. But, I mean, I felt like she was she was really good just, you know, watching her play um, some of the lower buy-in tournaments when I was home. And then the first time that I really thought that she, she could be, like, really seriously good was when I went to uh, the Bay 101 two years ago. Yeah. And I was sharing a room. I still remember it pretty vividly. I was sharing a room with uh, Ty Ryman, and we got home like after day one, and she's just she was just six handed with the chip lead in like a seventeen hundred person twenty four dollar tournament. Just won it for like twelve thousand five hundred. So I was like, oh well. Wow. She must know what she's doing. Then she final table bubbled both the million and the and the um I think it was the Sunday brawl. She knows, but uh yeah, like like within six months before the main event. So she was definitely making some runs and. She just played good, aggressive poker, and, you know, especially knew how to play short stack play. I think that's all she needs to – still needs to work on her deep stack game. She knows that, but obviously anyone who learns primarily online has a skill set that lends itself more towards, like, 30 and 40 big blind play and under. But then I also knew that as long as she could just play as well as she played online, the value of that play would be so much higher live because these people would just look at her – and she like looks like a live fish. She doesn't know how to handle chips or anything. So as long as she can play the same game, like the value of equal play feels like I feel like it's like two x lives. So I definitely knew going into it she was she was going to be profitable in the main event. And I was just trying to convince her like that the money wasn't a big deal, and she felt bad about maybe losing 10k. So I just told her that she was profitable and she had to look at it that way, just like I do. And she's understood that because you know she's been with me a long time and knows how I kind of approach those those like value questions. So it seemed kind of like a no brainer for me. Wow. Did did were you affected at all, Erica, by being in front of the cameras? I mean, you, we all remember years ago when Havad Khan was going crazy, and you know people kind of do these things, you know, for the cameras to get some recognition, and they act differently than they would, you know, outside the feature table. How did you stay focused and just play your game? Maybe being a newer player, it was easier for you to do that. I don't know. 
Um, well, you know, as a person, I wasn't really trying to do anything absurd or crazy to, like, get the attention on me. Um, I was just trying to stay as focused as I possibly could at the time with, you know, all the cameras around, something that's really new for me. And uh, the only thing that I would say kind of affected me was, you know, it kind of threw me off a little bit, and I think I would have played a few hands differently, or I know I would have played a few hands differently if I weren't on the feature table. But in terms of, you know, trying to say something ridiculous or act out to get the attention, I wasn't really looking for that. I was just trying to, you know, stay grounded and keep playing my game like I had been, you know, the past days before that. What sort of sponsorship opportunities were available to you guys. Did any companies approach you? Of course, in the past, before Black Friday, the sites were like, they were just hawking the players that were on the feature table. Was there any of that this year, or was it more just showing up and playing cards? Dave, um, well, you want to answer year, that? Yeah, Erica? Go ahead, <laughs> go ahead Dave. Um, well, Erica had Erica and I both had a opportunity for a patch deal. Erica did a scripts patch deal, which you'll see on... Uh, on the ESPN broadcast, and she just Jeez. got, you know, upfront money for that. But um, as far as long-term contracts, obviously it's uh, it's definitely like a transition year with Black Friday, and it's, it's on some level unfortunate for us that, you know, we don't get to capitalize on that marketing value immediately. But it's like all we can do is really, you know, just continue to try to be good ambassadors for the game and, you know, play good poker and continue to improve. And I just feel like, um, you know, our story is really compelling and both of us are really genuine people. And in the long run, you know, online poker is going to come back to the United States and somebody is going to need to brand themselves with good, recognizable players. And, you know, all we can really do is just keep keep trying to, trying to like, make good decisions and, and play well and just hope for the best. But it's, it's definitely, uh, a, like, an unprecedented year because of Black Friday. Let's let's talk about Black Friday for sure, and, and and talk about how it's affected you guys. I know that you're currently you're like house hunting, and you're gonna find a place, and I think it's in Vancouver. You know, this has really rocked the the serious poker players world. You know, the guys that have really made a nice living online. Uh, it's even rocked casual poker players like Brett and I. Um, so we've heard the stories, the, the, the Jungle Man stories that may have had four or five million dollars maybe stuck online in, in full tilt. And, you know, he's really, really in a tough spot. A lot of people are upset with full tilt the way that's gone down. In a lot of ways, we could see this coming. I know Brett went on a little streak where he won some money and he kept taking it out. He's like, man, I don't trust this stuff. How prepared were you for Black Friday? Because while we knew I think this could happen, I don't think a lot of us really believed that it was going to happen. Yeah, I was really prepared, to be totally honest. I had a pretty good read on the situation, and I really felt that Full Tilt was just so much more unstable than Poker Stars. So I had something like 98% of my online role on Poker Stars and like 1% on UB. Wow. Full Tilt each. And on top of that, I'm pretty diversified outside of Poker. Like, I have income earning assets, and I'm, I'm pretty involved in the stock market, and I try to just diversify myself well outside of the game. So it really honestly didn't affect me at all. Um, if it had been like a year and a half ago, I think it would have been more rough because a year and a half ago I was playing like almost exclusively online and I hadn't really fully made a successful transition to live and I was still, I mean, at the time I thought I was really comfortable, but now I just realized a year, a year and a half later how much more comfortable I am playing live. So like even, you know, the year, a year and a half before the main event, I've just felt like I'm playing really good poker live and I'm really profitable in basically every tournament I enter, whether it's like a high roller or a main event. So it, it didn't really bother me because before the main event, I was traveling in Europe. I went to the last two EPT stops and just played every event there and, you know, final tabled a couple events and did well. So I wasn't even going to be really playing online anyway. And then my plan from the beginning was to just figure it out after the World Series. After the series, Eric and I went home and visited my parents in Montana, which was fun. And then this is my second trip out to Vancouver in like a week and a half. I'm with my friend Tom Marchese right now before – Erica was with us and my friend Steve Gross, and we've just all been looking at places. But basically, I have a place lined up here for six months, um, and Erica and Tom and I are going to live together, and it's a nice place and a great city. So just kind of got to embrace it as an opportunity to have a little study abroad experience, and pretty fortunate that Vancouver is so close and such a beautiful city because it could definitely be a lot worse. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I, I was wondering, how did you clue in, though? Like, we, Brett and I had been playing on po uh, Full Tilt for years. We played on uh, Poker Stars through the years, too. But I, I never got that sense 
that Poker Stars was so much more professionally run than Full Tilt. Full Tilt to me always paid me whenever I, you know, wanted money or you know, I was able to navigate through yeah. things. How did you clue in that they weren't as stable? I mean, hell, Durr and Phil and all these yeah. guys, they were saying they'd put a million dollars up that you'd get your money back, etc. How did you know it wasn't so stable? Yeah, well, it just seemed like Full Tilt's like response time, like especially from like the security department, was a little bit slower. So I was always just somewhat suspicious, and it just. Like the the fact that you could just instantly transfer as much money as you wanted on Full Tilt, it was just it just had more of a feeling of like a renegade feel. And then what really took me off is when I started running multi-entry tournaments. I knew from a really reliable source um, that um, the multi-entry tournaments had been suggested by one of the Full Tilt team members, like at a team Full Tilt meeting, three or four years ago, and they never did it. And so I figured if they implemented it, you know, with like if if they just randomly decided to implement it, it must mean that they were trying to generate a ton of rake because they felt like the landscape would be drastically changing and they would be losing their customers because it's pretty obvious that multi-entry tournaments dry up the fish and and contract the economy in the long run so i figured they had a real short run objective when they implemented the multi-entry tournaments wow what is your at the end of the day <laughs> at the end of the day dave do you think that people have that have their money stuck on full tilt will get their um, money back honestly i am very happy to say that i have no idea and don't really have, I'm just not in a position to comment on it. Like I said, I have such a small portion of my role on there that I just haven't even paid attention. It just doesn't concern me, so I'd be lying if I made any type of speculation because, like I said, I just, I've just basically written that money off and I just don't even think about it, so it's a free roll for me yeah. if I get it back. I know, but hold on. Yeah, I, I don't want to push you, but you're out drinking with your buddies and you're goofing on your buddies that still have money there. You Deep down, you don't think we're getting paid, do you? I mean... I mean, it seems like you're pretty big dogs. I mean, the market, wow. poker players are pretty smart. I think I've heard that there's a market like like 20 cents on the dollar for full tilt money. So then I guess that means you're you're like 20% favorite. To Is that what it's down to money. now? It's down to 20 cents? I don't know. I don't really know. Like I said, I would just be speculating, but I think I heard it was that low. Oh, my God. Erica, did it affect you? Did you have any money there, or were you following the lead uh, of Dave? Yeah, I was kind of in the same position as Dave. I had, you know, a little bit of money on full tilt, and the majority of it was on poker stars. So uh, just followed his lead. And, you know, he obviously he has a lot more experience with online, and so, you know, he just advised me on what to do and what the best best way to handle it was. Hmm. Now, obviously, the both of you guys have plenty of money. Why not just take the year off? Why? I mean, you got your place in Vegas. Why even go out to, to Canada, Vancouver, and seek out a place? I mean, it just seems like such a big process when, you know, frankly, from the looks of it, you guys could take a year off, chill, and wait for online poker to come back to the United States. Dave? Yeah, I mean, frankly, for me, like I told you at the outset of this interview, it's really never been about the money for me. So I'm just, I just want to be playing poker because I really enjoy it. And also, I feel like, um, you know, I mean, I think I'm one of the top players in the game, and I'm definitely trying to become, you know, one of the really elite players in the game. And to do that, you just have to play a lot of hands and – Online poker is just a great resource to continue to learn and get better. And so, like, I guess for me, a pretty small portion of, like, every session I put in is about making money because, you know, I feel I feel pretty comfortable financially. So, it's, for me, it's just about trying to stay on top. And um, also, the truth is, like, a lot of my friends in poker, like, are coming out to Vancouver with me. I don't, I've never been the type of person that has, like, a real huge circle of friends. So, it's almost like I'm just transplanting, like, the – six or eight people in Las Vegas that I see mostly, and they're going to be out in Vancouver anyway. So hmm. just like I said, it's just like a study abroad experience where you just get to have an infinitely nicer place. And uh, it seems like a fun experience, you know, so why not? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm jealous of you guys in that in that regard. What What is your take on a lot of the scandals that have hit online poker? I mean, forget about Black Friday. you, you got, you know, all of the cheating scandals and everything else. I mean, Mike Mattis, I'll take it for you know, for what it is, being from Mike, but you know, he says it's so easy for guys to cheat online. Uh, he's really been ranting and raving lately. He gave one example where live, I don't know if this could be true, but live he won something like 52 out of 54 sessions or something, and but uh, you know, online he had one winning month in three years. Uh, you know, we all know about the the uh, the poker, the Portuguese poker prodigy. We interviewed him uh, a few months ago. That's kind of rocked the online world. What's your take on sort of just the security and the nature of online poker in general? Dave. Um, I mean, it, it seems like there's, you know, with the frequency of, like you said, like scandals that you hear 
you know, it's definitely disconcerting, but I just feel like that's part of the, that's part of just the reality of the situation. It's obviously unfortunate and you wish more people, you know, had a better code of ethics, but at the same time, I feel like there's a lot of other industries or businesses where people cheat and do shady stuff and, and things to get an advantage. And, you know, it's, I feel like you just have to operate within the rules and just do your part and, uh, and just but not be ignorant at the same time, recognize that it exists and, and just and just be aware of it, I guess, so that you don't get cheated. But I, I also agree that online poker has gotten a lot tougher, um, and I don't know if that's because of cheating or just because the game's gotten, you know, the game's evolved and, and more average players are good. But you know, at the same time, with what Mike Mattisau said, you know, I I feel like I've ran way below expectation live versus online, so I could say that I've, you know, over a pretty large sample size, weight made way more money online than live, and I don't think it's because I'm a better online player than a live player. So basically just what I'm saying is there's just an absurd amount of variance in any snapshot of tournaments, especially when you're referring to live or even cash game sessions. So I just don't give that much credence to what Mike said. Hmm. You could also just be way worse playing online. Right, right, for sure. Erica, what do your parents think? Because, or what does your family think? Because you know you had a regular job in LA, sort of successful career there, and then all of a sudden you're on TV playing poker. They may think you're gambling for a living. You're thinking about moving to a different country, or you are moving to a different country. I mean, that sort of has to. I mean, you're still young. That sort of has to sort of take them back a little bit and and maybe question you a little bit. I don't know. How's your family handling it? Um, well, you know, they weren't really used to the whole poker thing, um, you know, for me, but they knew that Dave was playing, and we've been together for a long time, so they know Dave, they know what kind of person he is and how responsible he is. Um, and they So they really didn't look at it as gambling, but as, you know, like a skill game, which it is. So once I started playing, once we moved to Vegas, uh, when I stopped working in L.A., you know, they were really supportive and, uh, you know, just whatever makes me happy, which I'm really fortunate to have to have the family that's just supportive with anything that I do. So um, when they saw me on TV, they were obviously really excited. And, uh, you know, I got a phone call every day of the main event for my dad, and um, all three of us talked every morning. And so, you know, it's just been a really great experience, and I'm lucky to have them. Hmm. You know, one thing that I read about, Dave, uh, was you were very outspoken about the guys that were playing in, in the women's event. And and I'm right there with you. I just think it's so silly, and we we talked about it at that time. And a lot of people, I don't know, they seem to, I guess because guys like Sean Deeb that are in a lot of ways so respected, kind of participated in that goof a year or so ago. It was wasn't maybe ridiculed as much as it should have been. I I found it to be preposterous, and I think you were sort of along the same lines, right? Yeah, I just think it's real absurd. And, you know, I, think, I feel like Erica's success story is kind of a testament to how great the ladies event is. Like, there's really, a, like, a, almost a 0% chance that Erica would have played the main event this year if she hadn't played the ladies event the last two years, you know, done well in it, got acclimated to the game, got acclimated to the World Series, you know, atmosphere, whatever it is. Because, I mean, I feel like a lot of us pros just take it for granted, you know, walking in the Rio and sitting down at the table. But I, I know for Erica, I feel like that was, that was one of the hardest parts. And once she was sitting at the table – you know, in the game, she was totally comfortable. And I think it just shows how, you know, for a lot of women, uh, poker is perceived as like a, a male-only sport with very few women involved. And I just think it's the ladies' event is just a really good tool to get more women involved in the game. And, you know, that's just good for the game in so many ways, like the poker economy and just like the general perception and popularity of the game. I mean, it's just good for, good for the game on so many levels. So I just feel like you have to be – you have to just either be really ignorant and not understand the long-run economic dynamics or just be so broke that, like, having 200% or 300% ROI in a 1K is that important to you to, like, do something that I just think is, is like, morally questionable and also just downright bad for the poker economy. And I feel like if you ask Sean Deeb, he would agree with me. I think he played the ladies' event two years ago. I and many other people got on him, and I'm pretty sure he didn't play it this past year. So I think it's basically consensus among good, respected players and, I doubt you could pull a player that played the ladies' event this past year and, you know, have the majority of the poker community think they were one of the, you know, best 100 or even 200 best players in the world. I just don't think it's done, you know, by respected players. Hmm. Now, you made a lot of your money, you know, obviously with MTTs, right? One of the greatest ever. I don't know if your record still stands of, what is it, eight or nine Sunday million? Most major wins. Yeah, yeah. or something r- ridiculous. Uh, do, have you made the transition to playing a lot of cash live, or are you still, are you still strictly uh, grinding tournaments? 
Yeah, I haven't played too much cash live just because I haven't had enough time. Um, I mean, I've just been I've been traveling the tournament circuit the last year, playing a lot of EPTs, and then obviously during the World Series, I was literally just playing every single tournament, all the noons and five o'clock. So, I mean, I actually started my poker career playing quite a bit more cash. I used to play live at Turning Stone Casino because I went to college in upstate New York, and I used to play some cash on like Bodog and some of the smaller sites, and and actually do pretty well, but. That's one of the things I'm looking forward to moving in with Tom Marchese, you know, who's obviously a really respected cash game player. Um, you know, I think, you know, I think I'll be able to help him with his like 30 big blind and under game, and I think he'll really be able to help me with like 80 plus big blind play and specifically cash games. So, um, you know, I've always been big my entire career about like just paying attention to and learning from good players, and so I'm just excited to to live with Tom and Erica, and I think we'll all three get a lot better at poker as a result. So I'm I'm definitely looking forward to playing a lot more cash games going forward because of that. Dave, are there any regrets from the World Series of Poker main event? Because obviously you guys picked up a lot of name recognition. You got a lot of publicity from ESPN. But when it comes down to it as a poker player, you guys finished 29th and 30th. And chances are you're never going to make a deep run like that again. You may never have another chance to win the World Series of Poker main event. I mean, other than sort of the, the, the cool stuff that's come along with making a deep run together, do you have any regrets from being deep in that tournament? I mean, I have absolutely no regrets. Obviously, it's disappointing to finish, you know, for me, anything but first in a tournament. Like, I would have been probably more tilted if I had finished 10th, for example, in the main event. But, I mean, that's different than having regrets. You're obviously disappointed when you have an opportunity to win any tournament, but especially that tournament, and then you factor in, in, in the extra money. So, yeah, obviously, I wanted to win more than anything, but... At the same time, I definitely don't have any regrets. I think I played as well as I could have, and like I, I was happy with my play. And you know, um, I just you just couldn't ask for anything more from Erica's performance. I mean, she she had like next to no live experience and really limited tournament experience offline and deep stacked, and she held her own in in a lot of situations and just really played great. So um, I don't feel like either of us uh, have any regrets. You know, we just are gonna like I said, continue to work and just improve in the game and. You know, it's unlikely we'll we'll make a deep run like that together, but I w- I'd be pretty surprised if over the course of our lives one of us doesn't beat our 29th and 30th place finish in the main event. I'd probably I'd have to think about it, but I'd probably book some action at a pretty good rate that either Erica or I beat <laughs> a, a 29th place wow. finish at some point. That's great, Erica. How much has your confidence gone up since this run? Gotta imagine it's skyrocketed. <laughs> Yeah, um, it went up, you know, a good amount. Uh, um, before I entered the tournament, you know, I, I registered the night before because I was, you know, still unsure of if I should play, and Dave was trying to convince me for about a week before the tournament. Finally, I decided, you know, Saturday night, the night before day 1D, that I would just go for it. Um, so as the days went on, you know, my confidence got, you know, more and more. Um, so now I feel like, you know, there's I have a lot more experience in live tournaments, and I feel like I can, you know, enter in some of the bigger ones now uh, or, you know, other events that are comparable to the main event, you know, with a little bit more confidence, which I think is really a huge part of the poker game, just having the confidence in yourself and knowing that you, you know, you're playing your best and doing everything that you can. Dave, how much, any, I'm sorry, Bart, real quick. Dave, how much are live tells uh, factoring into your game at this point? You've been doing it for a couple of years, I guess, that, that, you know, where you've really transitioned into live play. Are, are you, is that becoming, you know, are you king on some of these things that the live players have been king on for years, or are you still more of a math-based player? Um, I mean, I definitely, I guess I'm not going to answer, like, exactly how much I live tells, but I would just say that there was a point over the course of, like, my evolution as a live player where I definitely think I overweighed live tells and a point where I underweighed live tells, and I feel like, for me, it's just a one piece of information among literally thousands that you have to consider when making a decision on in like a given spot. So um, it's definitely, you know, with different players in different situations, you have to weigh it more or less heavily. But, yeah, I'm definitely getting some live reads that I wasn't, um, you know, initially or when I first started playing live. And, and like I said, that just, you know, the more information you have, the, the better decisions you can make. So so that certainly helps. Give, come on, give one old fish one live tell. That just jumps out at you, and it's always, you know, on time. Give me one freebie. Mm, I think the best thing is just if you, I mean, I just think the free information really comes when you're paying attention in between hands. So it's like things that you – I feel like a lot of the tells that I pick up on, I don't pick up on when I'm in a pot. I pick up, them, pick up on them, like, in between hands if I'm – 
from looking at people. But uh, I don't know. I can't give you any live tells. I, I, I know some people listen to your show, but I don't know who. So some people level me, and I don't know who's leveling me. So <laughs> if I somehow got a list of every person that listened to the show, I could give you the tip because then I could incorporate the right. leveling war. But I feel like I can't give I can't give away that. Oh, that's I can't give you my my favorite live tell. Oh, that's, answer, but, that's hilarious. <laughs> now you guys were down to three tables. You guys are sitting next to each other on TV. Was there any talk? I mean, obviously, being an experienced poker player, Dave and, and Erica, you you guys aren't going to do anything shady or soft play each other. But at the same time, you don't even want people thinking that. So was there any talk between you two or talk between any of the, the, the four people at the World Series of Poker with, with how you're going to play? Because you were sitting next yeah. to each other and, you know, what was that like? Yeah, I mean, it was definitely something that we had to deal with. Um I kind of felt like initially in the tournament we were, like like any other players, allowed to talk to each other in between hands about general strategy or reads on players. For example, when I got moved to the first table, you know, ben, my first feature table, Ben Lamb stood up, walked around, and we talked for like 10 or 20 seconds just about a few unknown players at the table and how they were playing. Like he gave me basically some of his reads and just the table dynamic, which is perfectly permissible within the rules. And so um, early on in the tournament I was allowed to like pull Erica over and talk to her about that in between hands, but then once we got moved to the feature table, um, the Rio floor staff told us that we couldn't, could no longer do that because it would be perceived on ESPN as polluting. So that was kind of frustrating. Um, I watched the coverage later, and I think the other commentator asked Phil Helmy if he was on the time if he had a problem with us, like, whispering in between hands, and he said something like, you know, I don't have 1% of a problem with it, um, which is obviously because it's well within the rules, but, you know, that's just some of the sacrifices you have to make for TV, I guess, and that's how the... That's how the rule was enforced by the Rio, so there was really nothing I could do about it at the time. But um, even having said that, you know, in hindsight, I think it was, I think it was an incorrect enforcement of the rule and, and somewhat frustrating. What, what about uh, when Daniel was going crazy about, I guess, the way that, that was at the World Series, right? About the, the yeah, no yeah, talking yeah. during the hand bit, and Dan, it just drove Daniel crazy because that's a big part of his <laughs> game, big part of his TV personality too. Um, who, who's on the right side of that? I mean, I can't really comment on that specific situation because, to be honest, I didn't see it. I was playing, I was playing the tournament, so I wasn't. I was really only watching specific tables where I knew people were going to be at my, at my table, like on the GVR the night after. So I didn't really. I haven't even seen that coverage yet, but I can't really speak to that. But you know, generally, I think um, that the tournaments run for the players, and it would be nice if the rules were enforced for the benefit of the players, not for the benefit of the TV crews. But at the same time, I still understand how important you know the TV aspect of it is for the game. So. I think it's a pretty tricky spot and just something that Harris and ESPN have to work together to improve on going forward because um, there were obviously some points of contention this year about a variety of things. Hmm. Erica, what was it like for you when you cashed? I mean, you busted 29th and you went to the cage and got your money. Was that a cool feeling or was it something you just kind of expected? What was that like for you? That had to have been um, cool. Well, Come on. <laughs> well, I, you know, throughout the tournament I really wasn't – you know, thinking about the money or the pay jumps. And so when I got knocked out, I didn't even know what pay jump we were on or, you know, they announced I got 29th place and that's how I knew because I was trying to just focus on playing and not worrying about the pay jumps and letting that affect me. So um, in terms of, you know, when I actually went and cashed out, yeah, it was a great feeling. It was, you know, I had a huge sense of accomplishment and, uh, you know, the extra money is always nice, but, uh during the tournament, I wasn't really thinking about it. By the way, what did 29th place pay? Uh, a little over 242000 Very uh, nice. Not bad, not bad. Look at her, completely yeah, so. unfazed. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I try not not let the money dictate how I play or, you know, how I live my life. So um, it's obviously nice, but I don't want to. Well, you know, just know it, com it, it would completely dictate Brett and I's life. I mean, there's a, right. There's no question about it. When Brett was on his little hot streak with his heads up, sit and goes. Tell him the story about your hair, Brett. I think they'd be I mean, curious. Stressful. I mean, I was playing, you know, hundred, two hundred dollar heads up, sit and goes, and it was so stressful. Like, part of my hair started to hurt, and so I googled <laughs> like, what does your hair hurting mean? And there's all these, you know, people writing about stress. I don't know how you guys do it. I mean, it's so freak. This game can be so freaking stressful right. just to do it day in and day out i mean respect to you guys that can do that does it affect yeah, your mood sick. go ahead erica What's that? 
Um, I actually got sick uh, the last couple of days of the main event. Um, really bad cold and cough and, you know, so it kind of took a toll on me uh, physically. But mentally, I think I held up pretty well. What about you, Dave? Do you, do you get tilted? I mean, come on. You, thinking about the money, the stress, the, the downswings? I mean, it definitely was a lot of stress, the main event, and it's a lot going on because I was obviously trying to help Erica, you know, evaluate the different situations she was in in the table and different opponents and different sack sizes and stuff. So I was definitely playing more than, you know, one main event throughout the whole thing. Um, I was going back and forth and checking on her. So that definitely took, like, a little bit a little bit of extra mental effort, but at the same time it was pretty fun. Um, but, I mean, I, I had just been grinding for, like, the, the two and a half months before. Like I said, I did, like, a three-week year up to her, and then the main event basically started when I got back. So it was really a long grind, and uh, it was real a real nice refreshing vacation to go back to Montana and visit my parents, which is obviously a much, you know, slower-paced field in Las Vegas. And, uh, you know, I just think it's important to take some time for yourself and, like, you know, just just dedicate some other priorities after a long grind like that. So I've been trying to work out real hard since I finished the main event and just uh, eat really healthy and just get some outdoors time and, and get some time away from the table. So, you know, it's just part of the game. But, I know, like I said, I love playing poker. So, so at the same time, no complaints about getting to grind great tournaments for three months. Just kind of part of the territory. you got to just take it and, uh, and kind of learn to adapt to the, the stress because it definitely does factor in. Dave, before we let you go, you know, you seem like such a grounded, both you and Erica, so grounded, kind of unfazed by it all. But I, I have to imagine that you've met a few people along the way that you had, a, a you know, sort of this perceived notion of. I'm not going to ask you to talk bad about anybody, but why don't you give me one guy that you've met or a woman that you've met on, on, on the, the, the tournament scene that you think gets a bad rap on TV or in the forums and either they're a much better player than you ever thought or just a much better person than you ever thought? Hmm. All right. I guess I have to go with the first one that comes to my mind. I'll probably get some shit for this, but I'm going to have to say Kathy Liebert because she gets kind of a bad... Uh, I don't know. I feel like she just doesn't get as much respect as she should. She has, she has real solid results, and um, I just played with her a lot live, and she's just real nice, and I think she has a... Um, that some people maybe don't get. So I think she's both somewhat underrated as a poker player and definitely underrated just as a, as a nice person who I enjoy having at my table because I think she's amazing. Wow. Er Erica, same question to you. Um, that's kind of hard for me because, you know, I haven't played that many tournaments. But um, uh... well, well, so – Something that you can answer, I think, is a question about your engagement ring because I was looking at a picture that either you uh. or Dave tweeted, and that's a freaking amazing ring. Did Dave pick that out? Was that he something did. that you spotted? Wow. I mean, that's no, a very. He... I mean, it's, have you seen this picture, Eric? Yes. Yes. I mean, it takes um, over her whole finger. Yeah, I have to give all the credit to Dave. He picked it out, designed it, did everything himself, um, and I had no part of it, so he did a great job. Wow, that is ballsy. He didn't even ask you, like, if I got you a ring, what kind would you like? Or He didn't even um, do that well, bit? Well, I mean, he knew that I liked a round diamond, and he kind of went from there. So. Wow. Right, what a stud. Nice job, Dave. What a stud, Dave. I took a, I took a, really, I took a really adventurous guess and guessed that you liked good. Big diamonds. That's a, that's <laughs> exactly. A <laughs> right. Right. That's a good guess. Awesome. All right. Well, listen, we appreciate you guys joining us. Uh, obviously, you're moving to Vancouver, so best of luck in Canada. And we hope, we all hope, online poker comes back to the United States. You guys can get back to, to Vegas and we can all start playing again. So thanks for coming on the show and best of luck. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for having us. We'll be back and forth. We're gonna we're gonna be in Vegas still pretty regularly, but uh, so you'll see us. So yeah, thanks. Uh, it was really fun being on here. Anytime. Awesome, awesome. Cool guys. Good luck. Thank you.